Thank you, Justin, for that introduction here. And thank you to, uh, the, um, to both Justin and Jeremy for this invitation and to the Silverman Center um, for, for this invitation. This is really an, an honor. So I'm uh, really honored to, to have this invitation. Um, before I begin, I, I'm going to just sort of tell you, so my background is, is as uh, Justin mentioned, in, in, in philosophy and in communication. So um, this project I'm presenting is start of a, um, I'm interested in doing a sort of urban phenomenological um, book. So investigating issues of how we live in cities and some of the ways that our c cities are set up in structures to con you know, perpetuate uh, conditions of racism and, um, um, and social economic discrimination and so on. So that's a, a sort of future project and I wanted to sort of work through uh, sort of analysis of homelessness through this, uh, through this sort of presentation here today. Um, also, I'll, I'll say this is that uh, when I was, um, when I was sort of asked to do this sort of presentation, before I knew that the theme was sort of liminality, um, I was also th thinking of sort of beginning this sort of first sort of chapter, this approach to sort of homelessness for um, a, another sort of place that's sort of used, uh, they asked me to sort of do a chapter related to homelessness, but it's sort of more from a performance studies, and they asked me to do sort of a theoretical approach. So I want to sort of warn you that there's a degree of sort of performance studies in here, meaning uh, some initial sort of social personal narrative, uh, but there is a theoretical sort of phenomenological sort of theory, so, but it takes me a couple pages to get into it. So I just want to sort of, not necessarily the traditional sort of uh, phenomenological ex exegesis. This is more, uh, it starts with sort of a narrative, a story, my, my story uh, and experiences, and then I sort of uh, do a lot of work with the idea of sort of phenomenological understanding of home and what we mean by home, uh, and utilize uh, my training as a, I can, you know, I'm a little nervous, I know we had a lot of Delusians, we have some speculative realists and so on here, but I'm, I still consider myself a, a Husserlian, and I'm not as embarrassed to sort of say that, so. <laughs> I'll see if you're in the Q&A, if maybe I need to be, so. Okay, so I'll, I'll begin. Um, let's see, keep an eye on my time as well here. So I think that, I can't remember if I changed the title of my topic or not, but uh, this is sort of roughly titled, Husserl in the City, a Phenomenological Reflection on Childhood Homelessness. <clears throat> uh, beginning with the first section is Discovering the Narrative of a Homeless Child. Between the ages of six and eight, I experienced homelessness. But I didn't know what it meant at that time. Decades later, in 2010, I agreed to a meeting with a representative from the Homeless Children's Education Fund here in Pittsburgh. I never would have imagined that the conversation could cause me to reinterpret my past. The purpose of this meeting was to find a new community partner that would allow my undergraduate students to work on a communication and public relations advocacy campaign for a neighborhood nonprofit. Instead, my labels and identifications of self were colored in a new hue. Memories flooded back, my visions of my childhood didn't change, but now I would understand those experiences in a different light. We use the ocular metaphor of looking back to talk about memory. However, the angles from which we reinterpret and look back to the past are forever changing with the new horizons of our current temporal flow. Our reflections are refracted by an ever-changing present. As we grow, the eyes through which we gaze into the mirror of self-reflection transform. Susie and I met in a coffee house in Pittsburgh Strip District. Our meeting place matched the industrial vibe of this neighborhood of Pittsburgh. I instantly took a liking to this representative from the nonprofit. She was full of infectious energy and enthusiasm, rooted in what I took to be a caring nature. She was down to earth and her eyes revealed someone who had lived a full life of experience and knowledge. Susie was hoping my class could think of advocacy campaigns to help r raise awareness about the McKinney Bento Homeless Emergency Assistance Act that Congress had recently failed to reauthorize. I had never heard of this law and didn't know its purpose. Um, this bill allowed homeless children to attend their original school by providing federal funding for transportation and removing home district barriers for enrollment, Susie explained. This was important because research showed that every time a child changes schools, they uh, are likely to fall six months behind their peers in learning. So this bill was supposed to support children to be able to keep going to the school they originally attended before becoming homeless. 
It allowed them to achieve a sense of normalcy of routine by sticking, by sticking with a familiar school during the rough period of homelessness. There was also empirical data uh, that the provisions in the law contributed to improve learning outcomes. The McKinney-Bento Act gave an official definition of what it meant to be homeless. Homelessness in the act is defined as, quote, children and youth who lacked a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, end quote. Now, the estimate for uh, Allegheny County here where Pittsburgh is, um, I think this last year was that 2,100 people had actually experienced homelessness, and um, I'll say a little bit about that in a moment, but the, this is measured by basically self-reporting by school districts. And um, so school districts and other uh, uh, institutions and community gr groups that sort of serve the homeless. So Susie explained that homelessness included children's living in shelters, cars, under bridges, abandoned buildings, motels, and on the street. She noted how difficult it was to find and count individuals experience homelessness, particularly children, because they move around a lot and could be found in a wide variety of settings, with families bouncing around to various friends and family members, finding shelter where they can, ending up on couches, spare bedrooms, floors, or any other available space, exhausting all options before finally turning to a shelter. Susie gave me an example. If a family loses their house through foreclosure and moves in with grandparents a few communities away, they are still defined as homeless. She told me about a boy she knew who had been waking up at 4 a.m. each morning to make three different buses from his grandmother's house so that he could finish school in the district where he lost his home. Sometimes he would run out of money or buses would be late and he had a rough time just making it to school each day. The McKinney-Bento Act aimed at assisting children like this boy in finishing their education. I was silent. I had a similar story. Up until this very moment, I had not explicitly recognized or thought that I had experienced homelessness. I never slept on the street or in a shelter, but I was the son of immigrants from Germany and Serbia. One day when I was five years old, my fa biological father did not come home. He was a gambling addict and lost all of our money. And for almost 25 to 30 years, I would have no contact with him. My mother was left to raise me, my three-year-old sister, and a six-year-old cousin all by herself. I understood my mother's tears when the food vanished from the table and she would try her best to stretch one meal into three or four. One of my most powerful memories as a child is still remembering going hungry uh, going to bed hungry. Then we moved in with my grandmother and everything returned to some degree of normality. There was food on the table and a roof over our heads. For some reason, it wasn't until this moment some 30 years later that I understood that we had lost our home. The first and only home I knew was forever gone in foreclosure. As a child, all I knew was that the man who filled the paternal role for those first few years is gone and we moved in with my grandmother. I would change schools five more times during the first six years as we struggled to find our own independent long-term housing as an immediate family. According to the McKinney-Bento Act, I was homeless. In fact, my situation was the first example given in the act. They said, quote, children and youth who are sharing the housing of other persons due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason, end quote. Why had I never considered myself homeless? Was it that I didn't know what homelessness was, or I just didn't understand it? It's important to remember in the early 80s, Reaganomics uh, was having a devastating impact on the number of homelessness in the United States. News coverage everywhere dealt with increasing number of people experienced homelessness that came with the decrease in federal aid programs during a recession that put even more jobs and people at risk. Um, I remember seeing the Academy Award winning 1986 documentary Down and Out in America in my middle school social studies class. I recall also my mother telling me about Bobby in my kindergarten class. His family had no money for clothes and lived in the public housing unit near the elementary school. As I outgrew clothes, we would give them to Bobby. This continued even as we lost our own home. My mom wanted to teach us that no matter how bad things got, there was always someone worse off than us who could use our help. My mom never used the term homeless or talked about losing our home. Yet I knew what it meant to be homeless and never self-identified as homeless. Why? The simple answer is because home is more than a mere place. In this talk, I want to advocate for a liminal definition of homelessness. I see this definition in line with David Cachala and Amardo Rodriguez when they argue, quote, There is an old saying that once you leave home, you could be anywhere. 
Once you leave home, everywhere can be home. Once you leave home, everywhere can be unhome. Once you leave home, movement may become home." End quote. So to put it another way, home is not a where, but a how we move through the world. We have the ability to build home anywhere, and we can leave home at any moment. This is a phenomenological idea that home is a particular relational experience between self and world. Home is an in-between way of living in the world. It is simultaneously personal and, irrevo and irrevocably social. It is a familiar space, but one that, is all, that also is limited with edges to the alien. Yet home is a space that can move, and it has to be constituted in terms of our experiences of the world. In the following meditation, I hope to show the psychosocial phenomenological liminality of the home. This theoretical story will be unraveled through the narrative of a lens of a child who has experienced homelessness. And I do want to sort of note the point here. This is a lot of people who work with uh, homeless populations. They really make a distinction of using child or person who experiences or has experienced homelessness as opposed to the label homeless child. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> I begin with a phenomenological account of homelessness followed by a consideration of the liminal experience of homelessness in the personal and social horizons. Section 2, Phenomenological Theory of Homelessness. Uh, phenomenology was born in the work of 20th century German philosopher Edmund Husserl. Husserl dedicated tens of thousands of pages written in shorthand as an attempt to provide both a framework and examples of doing phenomenology. The complexities of his methodology and nuances require time and detail beyond the scope of this presentation. However, there's one concept of his writing which is often ignored in the phenomenological and even the Husserlian exegetical scholarship. His frequent reflections on the experience of home and alien. Husserl thought that understanding the idea of home was central to a phenomenological method that was rooted in attentiveness to the world and the complex ways in which we inhabit our worlds. One of the stages of Husserl's phenomenological method was to engage in generative phenomenology. The term generative has two meanings. According to the philosopher Anthony Steinbach, and I use a lot of his work in this kind of presentation, uh, gen quote, generativity is both the process of becoming hence the process of generation, and a process that occurs over the generations." End quote. So generative phenomenology is concerned with how meanings come into being during the reflexive process of experience, and how our meanings are shaped prior to our experiences by the history of meanings that our experiences are born into prior to our actual lived experience. The latter definition is important because it states that experiences, the experience implicates the other prior to our comportment in the present. Husserl thus described the process of developing and establishing an identity. We do not come into being ex nihilo, but instead we mature. Our understandings and meanings are always tied to those who have given meaning to the words and experiences prior to us. We're always born into a conversation. And nowhere are these prior meanings more influential than in the home. Husserl wrote quite a bit about home and being at home in the world. Um, for Husserl, um, some of this actually still isn't even translated. For Husserl, the earth is of a special importance to us because it provides the ground from which all living things make a home. He felt that even if we left this planet, the ground of the earth still would provide an original common ground that would tie all humans together. Ultimately, the earth serves as a home for all of us. It is a primordial space from which we begin to make sense of the world. Yet it is also a social place that we are born into and raised in a shared life world of family and community. Here's how Husserl makes sense of this earth as home. Quote, Each has his acquired history on the basis of the respective ego which is made at home in it. If I am born a sailor's child, then part of my development has taken place on the ship. The ship would itself be my earth, my homeland. So he talks a lot about Heimwelt. But my parents are not then primordially at home on the ship. They have the old home, another primordial homeland." End quote. The point of this quotation is that even if we left the planet in some future time, the earth would still serve as an apodictic shared starting point for all human beings. For Husserl, it is the original ark, and he uses this metaphor in uh, an essay that Len Lawler has translated, um, from which we explore the world. The earth represents a shared home from which we all begin. It binds us together in a potential intersubjective community across time and space. The earth represents an actual physical ground and home. It is also symbolic 
of a way of being and relating indicative of a particular shared social becoming where we interpret meaning and make ourselves at home in any particular social space. The phenomenological home transcends a geographical and temporal space as well as the little place of our birth. Like Husserl's example of the child of sailors, this new phenomenological refiguring of the homeland or home world instead is a place that is a near world, one that is privileged because it is our world. Um, <clears throat> there's a, one of the psychologists here at Duquesne, I think there's a lot of interesting things on uh, Ava Sims on um, child in the world. She talks about birthing and being a mother and motherhood and sort of first notions of home and identity, which I think are you know, tied into this to some degree. More than just providing a common world and originary primordial, primordial set of experiences, the more specific philosophical notion of home is a place of normality, everydayness, and familiarity. The home is also a world that we create in harmony with the community around us. It is not merely a physical space where we live as a hermit-like individual, but a philosophical space of comfort that we co-create with the living community that surrounds us. The home world is also the edge of possibility that we pass through to explore the world inhabited by other people. The philosophical concept of home is not some place that a person can own. Instead, it is a place we're born into, brought up in a community of relations. The home is a built space, meaning that it's co-constituted and constructed by those around us in our immediate sphere of experience as a place of, as uh, Steinbach says, expressive communication with other people. The intersubjective compo uh, component of the home world is beautifully conveyed in Levinas' use of the metaphor of doors and windows in Totality Infinity. It says, quote, The possibility for the home to open to the other is, an es is as essential to the essence of the home as closed doors and windows. End quote. Continuing with this reflection on the door of the home, Richard Lang engages in a phenomenolog phenomenology of experiencing various doors. doors. Um, this is in a, a book on, on dwelling, using a lot of, of Heidegger's notion of, of home, but um, it's a collection of essays. And Lang uh, really reflects on the notion of doors. Lang sees the home as an extension of the body, as a way of relating to the world, and he emphasizes his importance in making an edge from the strange and alien. He says, quote, The home is the intimate hollow we have carved out of the anonymous, the alien. Everything has been transmuted in the home. Things have truly become annexed to our body and incorporated, end quote. It is important for Lang to be able to close the door to discover and mark off our individual intimacy. Yet the door also represents a threshold that we cross over to the strange and alien other. We wait before the door for the other. It is a symbol of hospitality and community, even when closed. As Lang also reminds us, the closed door often presents us with the invitation to knock. So he's quote, um, this is by Lang, he says, uh, Psycho psychologically, a door is most meaningfully disclosed when we are standing before it. Our ritual of knocking on the door is the embodiment of respectful waiting or pause. It is not an empty de gesture. With this respectful hesitation at a door demarcating difference, we provoke a life of community, of being together with others in difference. We celebrate the vital difference between self and other and thereby make possible a meeting at the doorway. We respectfully wait for the other." End quote. The door also is hospitality and sociality, not merely intimacy and individuality. Doors, be they open, closed, secret, metaphorical, or any other form, represent a liminal in-betweenness. They hang and move on hinges. The liminality is not only in the door, but in the way we inhabit and dwell in the home. In his analysis of immigrant literature, David Seaman, the sort of uh, phenomenological geographer, uh, points to the experience of home and homelessness as one of bodily movement and rest. The home is the place where we rest in dwelling but also the place from where we begin our journey. The home is a symphonic acoustic space of movement and rest. Um, Seaman does a lot of stuff with, with acoustic spaces in homes. That's quite interesting. A phenomenological understanding of home describes the way human beings create home and identities in the world and is less about an actual physical space. In her book, Home Uprooted, Devika Chawla describes a phenomenological understanding of home in her beautiful study of the narratives of home in India after the partition, partition between India and Pakistan. She points to Heidegger, Bachelard, and even 
uh, I'm going to butcher the Polish name, Rybczynski, as thinkers who present the idea of home as experienced. Chawla nicely sums up the phenomenological approach when she states, quote, Home is not just a physical location, but also a space of the imagination. It is viewed as a space that offers freedom and control, creativity and regener regeneration, and intimacy and closeness. Such a home can survive its material loss because it can be imagined and poetically excavated." End quote. Let me ruminate on two more phenomenological concerns about the home before beginning on my liminal reflections on homelessness. First of all, the home is not merely some instrumental tool. A home is more than the mere sum of its constructive physical materials. It holds a meaning for us beyond its usefulness. I think Levinas beautifully captures this when he states, quote, the home would serve for habitation as the hammer for the driving in of a nail or the pen for writing. And yet, within the system of finalities in which human life maintains itself, the home occupies a privileged place. The privileged role of the home does not consist in being the end of human activity, but being its condition, and in this sense, its commencement." End quote. Levinas's point is that the home is more than mere utility, but has another function as the space from which we begin our journeys. Just as people cannot be reduced to mere instrum instrumentality, the meaning of home escapes the instrumental capacities associated with it. We are more than mere objects in the world, and the home is more than a mere object as well. The edges of home are both in the imaginary and the physical worlds. It has a privileged role because it provides a space of meaning uh, from which we inhabit the world, yet constructs an intimacy marked by a foreignness. The home is always an excess that transcends itself. Uh, secondly, the edge of home, so my second sort of phenomenological concern is the edge of, or borders between the home and the people that inhabit that home is ambiguous. Phenomenology is an anti-dualistic methodology. The phenomenological method attacks the reductionism of various scientific and naturalistic approaches and seeks to reduce human meaning to either subjective or objective singular realities. Husserl pointed out how useless it is to talk of experiencing the world absent of our correlative sensual grasping of the world. What he means by this is that we can only know the world through our senses. Therefore, the world must always be interpreted. Maurice Merleau-Ponty was worried that this anti-dualistic method was not clear enough or went far enough, and he posited the idea of the chiasm to make this explicit. In his last unfinished work, The Visible and Invisible, Merleau-Ponty states that we are intertwined with the world, and that the demarcation between self and world is not a fixed point, but a, quote, reversibility, end quote. The name given to this intertwining of visible and invisible and self and world is the chiasm. Merleau-Ponty uses chiasm to draw our attention to the uh, impossibility of experiencing the world separate from our own flesh. He explicitly states that there is uh, an inter, inter, intercorpora, intercorporarity between our body and the world. We shape the world and simultaneously are shaped by the world. Perhaps no other space is as intertwined as the home. For the phenomenologist, the home is a symbolic space that we live in and shape. However, it is also an originary starting point, the first ship from which we sail and make sense of all our other future worldly interactions. The home shapes us as we shape it. Our flesh is fused to the home as living space. Uh, part three, individual psychological experiences of homelessness. So back to my work with the Homeless Children Education Fund. As we reviewed their PR materials, uh, my students noticed the absence of actual pictures of homeless children. Um, so my students have just been studying Aristotle's pathos and, and um, his artistic proofs, like notions of pathos and ethos and logos, and they said, hey, you know, if you had some pictures of homeless kids in there, this might be more effective for generating sympathy or, you know, pathos and, and getting more, um, you know, more donors. Um, the the community partner told the story that um, they don't use actual images of children. And she tells the story, on their very first campaign materials, they use a photograph of a young boy who had been accessing the programming, their homeless programming in a local shelter. They got the permission of the mother and even the young boy to use his image. I think it was two years later, they went to the local public school doing seminars to raise awareness about homeless youth in the school district. After the presentation, that same boy who was their poster child 
approached Susie in tears. He was shocked that they had used his image. He said he was no longer homeless and couldn't understand why his picture was there to illustrate homelessness. So his friends made fun of him and he felt awful. And after that moment, you know, the, uh, Susie told my class that they learned their lesson and never would use actual pictures of children again. Even with parental consent, the possibility of shame, embarrassment, and exploitation was just too much. Deep down, I knew I was homeless. Children are aware when their world is missing something that they see in others' experience. I didn't think of myself as homeless, uh, having experienced homelessness to protect myself. I felt ashamed and embarrassed that I didn't have a home anymore. All of my friends still lived in the same home and didn't have to switch schools. I knew that something was not normal in my experience and wanted to hide it. Losing a home was a traumatic event. Nowhere else can this be more harmful than the developing psyche of a young child. Did I do something to deserve this? Why did I have to live through this? And yet, children are also remar remarkably resilient. Denial was my early defense mechanism to lessen the impact of this trauma. I also felt incredibly guilty and still feel a sense of shame of this experience of homelessness today for some reason. Um, writing this, giving this presentation and writing this essay has been both uncomfortable and highly therapeutic at the same time. I don't do this normal performative stuff, so I'm more theoretical, but... Um, leaving home is an important developmental moment. In our modern Western experience, we typically undertake this phenomenon as a young adult going off to college. Yet here I was leaving home repeatedly, sharply, and traumatically as an elementary age schoolboy. My homing device was activated too early. Homing devices, explained by Sarah Ahmed, are orientations. She's, I, lo I love Sarah Ahmed's work on queer phenomenology. I, um, and here's a quote. She says, um, in terms of home, quote, as much about feeling at home, homing devices are about finding our way. Then it becomes important to consider how finding our way involves what we could call homing devices. In a way, we learn what home means or how we occupy space at home as home when we leave home, end quote. So she talks a lot about home and orientation and sort of leaving home and coming to terms with her identity in, uh, in terms of her sexuality and ethnicity and so on in relationship to her, her community. Homing devices allow for our orienting to the world. In her wonderful book, Queer Phenomenology, Ahmed points out that phenomenology reveals the way that we establish our orientation to the world. For Ahmed, uh, leaving home forced her to confront her ethnicity, her gender, and her sexual orientation. The homing device was the anchor to write from and against. Children shouldn't have to find their way and begin this movement away from home at such an early age. Childhood is meant to be a, a place of protection, safety, and stability. Leaving home meant that I would be forced to begin my journey of making myself home in the world without a home. My homing device was sending out a signal, but there was no place to receive it. The signal would go unanswered. Steinbach points to two liminal experiences in the structure of the experience of home. Home as, quote, appropriation, and home as, quote, transgression. In this, next, in this section, I want to deal with the idea of home as appropriation. Appropriation is where we take up objects in the world and make them our own. This is what the phenomenologist means by orientations. We always experience objects in the world as a relation. So I'm waiting for a good conversation with Tom on this. So, uh, Through perception, we experience the world and constitute various meanings for these experiences. The idea of home is one of the first places for which we appropriate a meaning. Going back to Husserl's example of a child of a sailor, the ship would be a space the child would or could appropriate as a first home. However, what about children who are forced to appropriate a meaning for the home at an early age because they lose or never had a home to begin with? How can we appropriate the meaning of home in absence? Ahmed, Husserl, and the phenomenologist uh, Schutz. I want to say that in my larger book project, I feel like there's going to be a lot of... Schutz does a lot of work in terms of sociology of phenomena, the sociological sort of phenomenology in, in urban spaces. That is, I didn't work into this presentation, but I know I'm going to have to uh, in the larger project. Um, Ahmed, Husserl, Schutz provide reflections on normality and abnormality. There's great essays on normality and abnormality in Schutz and Ahmed. Um, through phenomenological orientations. Can we make ourselves at home in the world when we are without a home? I believe we can. 
Oddly enough, the child without a home may undergo a journey much like the young sea turtle described in Patricia Huntington's beautiful description of loneliness in her book, uh, Loneliness is Lament, A Journey to Receptivity. Um, the sea turtle is born on the sand alone and must crawl across the beach in a lonely search for the ocean, a home, and a mother. Like the turtle, she says, our task uh, is, quote, as creatures endowed with freedom is to choose willingly and thereby realize what at root we already in essence are. This means first and foremost that we must journey home to aloneness, end quote. The journey home is a lonely one. The sea turtle and the child don't have the freedom to choose their home. However, a child does have the ability to construct a home even when one isn't there. We have an existential ability to make our own homes. Our existence is not a fixed essence that essentializes us to a pre-crafted home and identity. Ultimately, we have the power to appropriate our personal world and author our own orientations. Building on the work of Husserl, David Carr reminds us of the importance of uh, thinking of ourselves as a phenomenological narrator in crafting our identity. Another interesting point uh, that in German, that uh, this is from, from uh, I think both Steinbach and Carr, the term Geschichte uh, translates to both narrative and history. So Husserl often uses these terms interchangeably. History and narrative share some similar qualities. There is a similarity in the phenomenological idea of authoring our own narrative and history and Ahmed's notion of orienting oneself either within the bounds or as a response to the various constructions of home. Phenomenologically speaking, narrative and history are not a science of objective facts. Husserl and Steinbach assert that, quote, narrative is an essential way in which the unfolding of historical time is experienced as development. Home comrades experience their temporal development of the home world in the structure of Geschichte, history or narrative, end quote. In my childhood, it was important for me to redefine my home and my situation of homelessness as one of stability and non-homelessness. It was a protective mechanism to not think of myself as homeless. Every child wants to fit in and feel loved. To orient my identity as experienced homelessness would make me different. It would cause people to feel sorry, ignore, or hold some other view of my situation of homelessness and not see me as me. The homelessness had the potential to overtake my entire identity, and as a child, that was something that was dangerous. Of course, since we are never essentialized into one moment or temporal identity, I always was and will be more than this homeless child. That's why you know, I like the term experiencing homelessness. To make oneself at home in the world requires a flexibility to author and interpret our experiences as we see fit. So here I want to stress the individual's free ability to author their own narrative and construct the idea of home that they desire. Home isn't fixed, it is appropriated by us based on our individual psychological orientations toward the world. For a child experiencing homelessness, um, this freedom is important so that he is not reduced to the reductive essence of being homeless, but instead can build an idea of home that allows him to reinterpret his story as a child who has merely built a home elsewhere. This linguistic measure is important because it provides a bit of self-protection. It is important that we protect the liminal nature of narrative interpretations of home to allow for the individual to find their home in any sort of manner that does not reduce them to a set of negative experiences. For me, it was a forgetting and reshaping of my home into my grandmother's house. For other children and adults, they may need to do the same. Section 4, Social Intergenerational Anthropology of Homelessness. So I'm going to now offer a different sort of liminal definition or, or tactic. Yet the story of the individual in phenomenology is never an individual one. Even if we start the journey alone, we eventually come face to face with others. The sea turtle begins the journey with a lament of loneliness on the shore, but eventually swims with the mother and community of turtles. What was the source of embarrassment of, for having experienced homelessness for me? This is a horrible societal stigma. There's a, I'm sorry, there is a horrible societal stigma attached to being homeless. As a society, we often blame the individual for the condition of homelessness. Having spent a few years now working with students and helping them reflect on their preconceptions of the homeless, it is still the case today that the prejudicial view is that uh, a homeless person is thought to be a single man, an addict, a person who is lazy or mentally ill. Before I do work with the Homeless Children's Education Fund, I ask students to sort of lay out four or five different phrases that constitute, you know, uh, 
what what is homeless? You know, what do you think of when you hear the term homeless? And they often say things like drug addict or you know drunk or living under a bridge or beggar or veteran. And I've even heard the word choice. And I remember a story about a, a, a student told like, well, I, I, there's this guy I wanted to help, and you know, well. He didn't want help. He wanted to be homeless, so he didn't want someone to help him. So he really wants to be homeless, and um, and so instead of the responsibility of job and a home, he just wanted to drink and do drugs. Somehow, the condition of homelessness is thought to be deserved or even chosen by the homeless individual. Yet these labels don't fit the common experiences we know about those experiencing homelessness. On a single night in January. Uh, 2012, 38% of all homeless people were families, and this is from the um, the U.S. Department of Housing Urban Development sort of website. Um, that is 239,403 family members. The U.S. Census does not collect information on homelessness, but the Department of Housing and Urban Development does. According to their report, the typical homeless person is actually a child under 18, living in a three-person household, um, black, living in a city, staying with family members before entering a shelter where the person experiencing homelessness will spend an average of 28 nights in that shelter. The economics of the situation tells us that our assumptions about who is homeless don't match the data. Um, there is something wrong when such a rich and powerful country allows so many to fall through the cracks. There's a rhetorical war on the poor in this country today. The far right wants to declare that the poor are responsible for their own condition. That is why there's an attempt to ignore the fact that children are homeless in this country and to focus reporting and statistics that lessen the impact of homelessness. A disgusting example of this is the Heritage Foundation. I know they're horrible, but you know, I, they, they really try to disprove or lessen sort of the you know, impact of homelessness, so I'm gonna give you some of the things they say here. Um, a disgusting example is that one of the, on their report, uh, their report was titled "Air Conditioning, Cable TV, and Xbox: What Is Poverty in the United States Today?" Um, in a move to exaggerate and obscure the conditions of the poor in the United States, the Heritage Foundation focused on all the items found in the average home below the poverty line. The idea was that by showing the percentage of the poor with refrigerators, God forbid, computers, and t TVs, they would show the condition of poverty was really not so bad. As a matter of fact, the quote of uh, one of their authors, James Wilson, say, says, quote, the poorest Americans today live a better life than all but the richest person 100 years ago, end quote. So the Heritage Report claims that poverty statistics don't accurately represent the life of the poor in the U.S., and they worry about the data on poverty being used to give the U.S. a bad image abroad, or increase funding to poverty programs and increase taxes. Um, so instead, the Heritage Foundation turned to, uh, turned to an obscure U.S. Department of Energy survey of some 100,000 households to, to determine the actual living conditions of the poor, rather than actually talking to the poor. The Heritage Foundation emphasizes things like big screen TVs and video game systems. But there was no attempt by the Department of Energy to measure or count homelessness or those in shelters or the actual conditions of, you know, of poverty. Uh, but yet the Heritage Foundation still felt comfortable to state, quote, those who are without food or homeless will find no comfort in the fact that, you know, that their condition is relatively infrequent, end quote. Uh, the Heritage Foundation doesn't want an accurate picture of the poor or homelessness in the U.S. Instead, they want an account that matches their political narrative that poverty and homelessness isn't that frequent or severe. So when the numbers don't match what they want, they turn to a different one, a uh, different set of numbers, uh, without even focusing on poverty. They don't want to count the poor because to them, the poor just don't count. They dismiss narratives of the everyday poor as sensational, but have no problem with the sensationalism of their own report. Knowing that the vices are in these households does not tell us whether they're actually used or how they came into the household. Um, not that a poor person shouldn't have a TV. Several weeks ago, the Pittsburgh uh, newspaper, I think it was, was, it la was it last month, um, made a report that there are 24 families living in public housing that are making more than $50,000. We should be outraged that our tax dollars are being stolen and misused in this way. Yet no one asked. The, did the family make fifty thousand a year before, and now was homeless, and that is why they're in the shell, shell, you know, this public housing? Or are they in public assisted housing because of a disability? That's also something that's in one of the roles of a public housing. 
Uh, or was this a family that was doubled up? So is this a $50,000, a family of 10? That's not a lot of money. Um, these 24 households were less than 1% of all public housing residents in the city of Pittsburgh, not to mention the thousands more waiting uh, on a list to get in. Instead, uh, this is the typical demonization of the poor that goes on and the homeless. There's a desire to show that the homeless guy that is, is really scamming us by making millions of dollars, or the woman driving a BMW to the food bank, uh, but nobody stops to hear their stories. Instead, the homeless and poor are thought of as a transgression against us. They take from us and don't deserve our help. There's a process of distanciation and othering that dehumanizes and allows us to not have to respond to the face of the stranger when they need shelter or food. For Husserl and phenomenology, the term home is understood alongside the idea of the alien. In a sense, the home only becomes home in the face of a stranger. For Husserl, the alien world is transgression. What he means by this is that my experience of the alien is so foreign and beyond the pale of my own experience that I cannot constitute the alien's inner world of experience as my own. There instead is a radical break between our different cultural life worlds. For Husserl and Levinas, culture, the cultural sphere of the alien is so foreign that it takes on the characteristic of being incomprehensible. This is from, um, from uh, the Husserliana that Steinbach translated that hasn't been translated. Quote, the alien is not experienceable without further ado as that which is already familiar. Rather, the alien is initially the incomprehensible alien. End quote. Critics who have not read the depth of Husserl's scholarship try to reduce his understanding of inner subjectivity to a reduction of the other to the same. However, this is not correct. We see Husserl's rich appreciation of difference in his reflections on the home and the alien. The alien is radically inexperienceable. However, Husserl wants to move beyond the mere abstraction of Buber's I and thou relation and instead is interested in the actual encounter with an actual alien. Hulstrow explains that in the encounter, we see that the alien has a home world of their own that is radically different from my own. Quote, calling the alien world, friend Welt, an alien world, friend Heimwelt, means that an incomprehensibility of the alien and the rupture of normality instigated by the alien do not remain on an initial level of anomalous incomprehensibility, but reaches deeper into an incomprehensibility that has the integrity of another norm normativity, one that cannot be overcome through a simple appropriation, end quote. We recognize the cultural difference of the alien world, but recognize the normativity qua alien experience. This is an important moment in the phenomenological notion of constitution, for when we actually encounter an alien, our home world is turned upside down. In recognizing the alien world as having their own narrative home experience, we see that our conceptualization of home is not universal, inevitable, or unchanging. Instead, the alien experience is a transgression to our home because it reveals the contingent nature of our very own home world that we've known from birth. The alien calls our home into question. It shows us that it doesn't have to be that way. The alien also introduces an ethical responsibility. This is more Levinas, I think, than Husserl here, perhaps. But the appearance of the alien brings borders and limits to my conceptualization of home. The alien also has an alien home world that is beyond my experience. Yet, the encounter with the alien requires a response. I might not ask for the knock at the door. This is the transgression. But when it appears, I must respond. Even choosing not to respond is a response. As Husserl, Levinas, and Steinbach claim, I am asymmetrically responsible for the other. The responsibility is with me, within my home, when I hear the knock. To not respond is a form of violence, yet one that is often reached through an internal logic. Steinbach refers to this logic as a, lo as a quote, logic of dissimulation, end quote. He explains that the logic of this concealment and, and self-deception as follows. It is a logic of dissimulation because it seeks to conceal the responsiveness endemic to a liminal encounter and to dominate it in a one-sided reification of liminal experience in which it is the alien who is made one-sidedly responsible for and accessible to the first, end quote. I just want to say, think of how... Um, 
we are failing to live up to this asymmetrical responsibility um, right now in that sort of border crisis of immigrant children uh, who are, you know, we're, we want to ship them back, right, without any sort of question about what is, you know, responding to the face of the child, who are often, you know, discriminating, uh, who are fleeing horrible conditions of violence and if returned home may even be killed in their own homelands. When we encounter an alien other, it calls our home into question. It's a transgression. It puts our home at risk in that our home does not have to be constituted as, as it is, but could be the home world of the stranger. At the same time, we have a responsibility to the stranger. Their world is strange and inaccessible to us, but we must respond. The knock at our door must be answered. Steinbach pointed to potential social and political implications of the asymmetry of the transgressive encounter between the alien and the home. I believe the experience with someone in the condition of homelessness prevents such a moment. The problem with the Heritage Report and many encounters with the homeless is that they commit, um, and, and, and their many encounters with the homeless, is that they commit violence to the home world of the alien experience of homelessness. There is a need on the far right to reduce this experience of homelessness to a fraud, or not, too bad, not so bad, for several reasons opened up by their, you know, by their own analysis. But instead, I, you know, we turn to phenomenology. First of all, the world of homelessness is completely foreign to someone who has not experienced it. It calls into question the experience of home as safety, stability, and permanence. The presence of the individual experienced homelessness means that this is a potential home world that exists on the planet and therefore calls the inevitability of the perspective of home as safety into question. Homelessness in this instantiation is feared as a disease like leprosy that we must stay away from because it could potentially infect us as well. Kind of like almost the zombies from yesterday. Um, the zombies are homeless, I think. Yeah. Second, after having their world put into question by the otherness of the person experiencing homelessness, a response is required. Seeing this stranger without a home demands an, a response as an ethical obligation. By the way, for the Purdue crowd, this is a lot of this. You can hear, hopefully, Kelvin Schrag, one of our <laughs> teachers. Um, this is particularly more powerful when it is a child. So as a form of violent obfuscation, right-wingers engage in a form of victim-blaming. There is an attempt to claim to know what the experience of the homeless must be like. Um, just like we have you know, male conservatives now in Congress who legislate women's bodies. Like, well, this is what the women's body must be like, right? Remember the guy from Missouri? He's like, Does a woman's body has these natural ways of getting rid of rape, right? Um, these experts. In particular, there is a claim that the homeless person deserves this condition, or it isn't so bad, or they actually like it. The victim blaming is a rationalization that allows for a non-response. It protects the status quo of the system and removes my responsibility for the alien other, be they widow, orphan, or stranger. And you know, Levinas' um, imagery is, I think, really profound for demonstrating our asymmetrical responsibility. Um, you know, those, that metaphor of widow orphan, widow orphan strangers is powerful for, I think, conceptualizing homelessness. The victim being, blaming allows for not, their non-response to, this, to these others. When the other appears before me in the form of a transgression of a homeless child, I have a duty to respond. The experience is so foreign to most Americans' everyday home world experience. It requires us to respond both individually and collectively. We cannot understand the child's experience, but we cannot ignore them. We cannot blame them. We need to respond. This is why I emphasize the liminality of experience of homelessness. So as a child, I needed the psychological protection to build a world where I didn't see myself as homeless. However, as an adult living in an unjust world where people refuse to respond to the need of the other, I see a need in putting the stories and faces of the homeless right in front of them uh, to remind us of the broken home world which we've all created and we must repair. And this is my last part, conc uh, conclusion. Uh, begin with a, another Levinas quote. To, quote, to dwell is not the simple fact of the anonymous reality of being cast into existence as a stone one casts behind oneself. It is a recollection, a coming to oneself, a retreat home with oneself as in a land of refuge, which answers to a hospitality, an ex expectancy, a human welcome. In human welcome, the language that keeps silence remains an essential possibility." End quote. The responsiveness to the alien world of a child's homeless experience must be one of hospitality. Home is a liminal space. This means that we create our home. It is not fixed, and it can be otherwise. 
It is always formed in relation to others. Home is made in appropriations in the world and differentiated and protected in transgressions. Yet it can always be otherwise. Uh, recently, there's been a renewed sort of interest in sort of the phenomenology of hospitality. There's a great sort of edit collection by K Richard Carney and Kasia Simonovich called The Phenomenology of the Stranger Between Hostility and Hospitality. Um, this work and others like it have built on the phenomenologies of Husserl, Levinas, and Derrida in various investigations of our home world. Uh, that particular collection of essays offered by Carney does a similar liminal project around the idea of the stranger. According to Carney, the encounter with the stranger is often experienced on either extreme of hospitality or hostility. The experience of the stranger is intimately personal, especially when the stranger knocks on the door of our own home. Homelessness in particular is scary because it calls our own homes into question. It shows us that it is something that we can lose and requires us to respond hospitably to those without a home before us. The liminality of the experience of homelessness allows for flexibility in its definition to protect a child in anonymity while forcing a society to look back. It is both concealed and revealed for different horizons. This reflection has forced me to return home to my experience of homelessness. And in writing it, I have realized that what I needed was hospitality. I had lost my father in my home, but my grandmother's hospitality provided my family a safety net. She provided us with house, beds, and food. The hospitality of my grandma's house was also a refuge of safety where my mom didn't have to worry about my father kidnapping us or worse, what, the, uh, what her, his debt collectors might do to us. And um, many years later, my mother told me that she had a gun and that she would sleep under her bed because she was so in, in fear uh, that during those years. Um, there was hospitality as soon as we crossed the threshold of my grandmother's door. I know that there are many others out there who did not have a hospitable response when they knocked on the door asking for housing. Homelessness is a creation of our own current societal structures. The structures do not have to be this way. They are the way they are, and no child should, not, should have to experience homelessness. All we have to do is answer the knock on the door. Thank you.